All right, friends, I'm going to get started, and you're not going to fall asleep on me, or uh, we're going to have some words afterwards. Well, not after that phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will talk loudly. All right, my name's Diana. I'm an internal security developer at Shopify, and I have trust issues. Not those kinds of trust issues, but I do have device trust issues, and I do have identity trust issues. And I, uh, you know, my slides are very slow, so give me one sec. And um, what I'm here to talk about is these kinds of issues related to a new framework that we're adopting as we scale in new and terrifying ways at Shopify. So my agenda is pretty straightforward. I first want to cover Shopify so you all know what it is and our culture and really explain to you why we believe that this type of security model works best in our environment. Next, I'm going to talk about some of the ways that we started implementing the, these changes. And uh, this is probably over the last the past year, I would say. And uh, afterwards, I'm going to give you a few examples as well, or I guess along the way, that one's sort of up in the air. So let's get into it. Who here has seen this logo and knows what Shopify is? Raise your hands. It's not bad, like five people. That's great. All right. Uh, well, uh, we are not just an e-commerce company. That's the first, first bit, all right? What we are is we are a platform, and we give anybody the tools to sell online, in person, on social media, or out of the boot of their car. I think I said that right, boot. I was going to say trunk, but I'm in the UK, so anyways. Uh, and we are on a mission to make commerce better for everyone. So with that, let's get into numbers. We have over 600,000 merchants in over 175 countries, one of them being me. It's pretty great. And as for our internal employees, we have roughly around 3,000 employees and in around six offices around the world, not including all the remote staff that work from home. And of course, interns. This is a picture from our in intern onboarding uh, in January. This was all the interns that started. We do this quarterly. This is all the laptops that had to get set up for that intern onboarding. This is our reality. And uh, because I like to brag, because I love my company or whatever, um, I wanted to share some cool things that we've done. Uh, Tim Cook just visited us two weeks ago uh, at our Toronto office to see what we're doing with AR, VR. We're super into that kind of world right now. It's great. Uh, the, your, your very own Prince Charles and Camilla visited uh, 150th Canada Day and they helped launch 14 new businesses powered by Shopify. Pretty sweet. And we also do things outside of the celebrity stuff. We do uh, sponsor events like SheCommerce. This is a workshop for women to build entrepreneur uh, e-commerce e uh, empires. So as you can see, the theme is extremely heavy on entrepreneurship. And it's probably, be, probably because one of our initiatives is to take the path that leads to more entre entrepreneurs. So merchants are our success. This is what we do everything for. Um, their success is our su success. And so what we want to do is remove roadblocks from them doing everything they can to sell their product. And this not only founds why we are dedicated to providing the most secure platform, it defines our internal culture as well. So, Next point I really want to talk about is culture. And I've talked before several times at different conferences about this because we are a little bit weirdo, I guess. And um, basically, every company has a culture. You have your own. We have our own. And it's extremely critical, or we believe it's extremely critical. We go on and hire extremely talented people to work at our companies. We have a very, very, very intense and arduous interview process. And when they get here, we treat them like extre extremely talented people. And what we sort of think of it is uh, a trust battery. So a trust battery is, is basically a battery that you have between a, yourself and another person, and you believe that they're capable of making their own decisions. And they tend to not let you down. So with this high level of trust and autonomy, it feeds directly into our five culture values. Yep, one of them is definitely get shit done. Um, Pretty self-explanatory, I'm not going to go through each one. I've covered these before in talks. What I really want to talk about is why I'm here and what value our security team tries to protect. And that is default to open internally and secrecy externally. 
and obviously show you some off awesome pictures of some of our offices in the world. So, why do we care about this motto as a company? Well, the idea that we <coughs> center around this is that we want information to flow freely at all levels of the company. Rather than start from a point where we choose what to share, we start from a point where we choose what not to share. And we believe that by having this level of trust and deep level of inf information, which we call context, it makes everyone make the best decisions. It's like giving everyone all the tools. The flip side to this, of course, <coughs> is secrecy externally. That just means I know everything about Shopify and you just know what you can Google. Um, and it works really well for us and this is what we try to defend. So why do we care as a security team about this? Well, like I said, every company has a culture. But what we're trying to do is maintain a unified culture. And by giving open access and providing no roadblocks in communication, what we're trying to do is prevent dissonance and prevent countercultures. I'm going to give you an example, because you're all probably panicking, thinking, how is this, how is this even, how? Um, imagine that I started at your company as a junior IT admin, and I have varying di different levels of access because I'm new, because, it's because of my title, all that kind of stuff. And I start getting into the work, and I do tickets, and I, whatever, do projects in your, in your team. But I may not be able to see certain things that you do based on my access levels. And Sometimes they, that might not mean anything and it might not result in me feeling differently about my company, but sometimes it could also create a smaller culture within my own department. I maybe will feel like this lack of context or access, you know, makes me less creative. I can't play around with tools that I was hired that I thought I would be using. Uh, maybe even less innovative. I can solve a problem one way, but somebody else may, may be able to solve it three different ways. And I have felt that way in the past, so I know that this could be, could be a possibility. And the worst part is that I could feel untrusted as an employee and feel sort of less committed to any of the projects that happen and go to work and do my job and go home and be like <coughs> indifferent. And this could just lead to demotivation, but it can also lead to being disgruntled. And so don't just take my word for it, because obviously I like basing things on research. Um, I read a, a paper, which I'll, I'll link in my references in, at the end, where they interviewed researchers that worked on, uh, on various projects, and they discussed th these three main values, trust, commitment, and openness, in, in, ref in respect to the project performance and outcomes. The results were that all three of these values are essential for teamwork. Pretty straightforward, like, you would have assumed that that was going to happen. The things that they also realized was that this high level of trust, by having a having high level of trust between people, increased uh, involvement level, it increased knowledge sharing, and it even hinted, hinted at um, enhancing trust through a reward system, which would, would also improve the way that people communicate with each other. Other takeaways were things like openness in communications <coughs> leads to lots of context, which means problem solving quicker and better results on your smaller pieces because you know, you know the grand scheme of things. So with that, I'm also going to give you an example, because I'm just full of examples today, uh, about my own personal experience in regards to default to open at Shopify. So I came from big corporate world, telecom, Canadian company, blah, blah, where default to open was not a thing. And I'm sure some people in the room are like, no, it's not a thing for us either. Um, in this environment, you could do your work, everything was fine, but there were certain mandates. One of our mandates became to deploy Jamf Pro in that environment. For inventory, for managing updates, for building policies, all that. Great solution, worked well. So, pretty easy to do. Uh, we had admin access to all devices, SSH access. Easy peasy, drop a quick ad, and, and you're good to go. Then I left that company and started at Shopify as an IT specialist, and I was tasked to do the same thing for a larger company, not really understanding <laughs> the open culture. So, okay, started thinking about it. No SSH access. All right, narrowed down my plan of deployment here. No admin accounts for, for the IT team. Okay, cool. All right, I'll just send email inviters. That's fine, not a big deal. So that's what I did. 
And over the course of, I would say, two months, we had trickled enrollments, everything, and I'm like, okay, it's getting there, but why is it slowing down? And eventually what we noticed was that there was a group in, in Slack which created a lot of dissonance because of this project. And I, being me, being new to the company of, I think, three, three months into my, into my new job, I was very confused by this. Um, this group, and their name was great, the channel was called The Ghostbusters, so that was pretty sweet. Um, maybe not at the time. Anyways, uh, they, they thought that there was a lack of transparency, a lack of context as to why we needed this specific tool, which, was, which could do a lot. And they felt spied on, felt demotivated because of it. And it wasn't that I was lying to them or anything, they just felt untrusted as employees and I felt untrusted as an admin even though I had done this before and I'm, I'm doing it for the betterment of, of inventory and management and all that good stuff. But ultimately culture was being attacked here. And so luckily we had a quick t thinking security team when this happened that built not one but two solutions to our, to our big, two big problems. First problem. People don't want audit access to every device. They don't care about so-and-so's device, my device. They want to see what we can see on their own device only. So we built Friendly Ghost. Friendly Ghost is pretty straightforward as you can see. Maybe I can use this thing. Oh yeah, look at that, that's great. Um, so we use the email address here. The users uh, authenticated with Google and we use the API to pull just the specific devices associated to their email address. Everything else is API calls pulled into a Ruby on Rails web application. We have policies, OS profiles, restricted software, so on and so forth, and everything we can see about that device. Then we also have a self-service policy that opens the log for them so they can compare if something strange is happening on their device. They can come here and see what policy it was. Pretty neat, and I will talk about it more later. Second issue we had. This covered 80% of our cases, I would say. There's that other 20%. And the other 20% was senior production engineers and senior developers that have been there since the company was in the tens of employees. They had an issue with the fact that they didn't feel trusted for being such seniors and always being secure and even building specific security mandates. So we built Ecto Containment Unit. We went with the theme until, until Jamf changed their <laughs> Their naming, I'm not changing these, I don't care. Um, so basically what this is, it is open source, so you can check it out uh, at the link above. It probably needs a bit of tweaking with, uh, with High Sierra, but <coughs> it, is, um, it gives us full inventory reporting MDM profiles, but it is sandboxed. It's a sandbox champ binary, so it does nothing else, and it's great. And this whole slew of things taught me a valuable lesson about how Oh my god, this mouse. About how giving context will prevent pe pe people feeling like they're being built inside of a box. And then each time you do deploy specific projects like this, you're sort of refilling that trust battery again. And it's kind of fitting later that I joined the security team. So today I'm here telling you about culture and telling you about this because we, we base all of our projects on maintaining this default to open and maintaining the trust battery. How fitting that the team is called Trust. So our team, it's an umbrella, so this is a group of teams, is platform integrity, IT is part of Trust, application security, internal security, so on and so forth. We are in charge of buyer, merchant, and employee trust. And now you sort of understand, and I've given you a 13 minutes worth of context on why we do what we do. I want to start giving you context on my team, the internal security team, who's in charge of deciding what kind of security model works in this open culture and how it would fit. So, you're probably familiar with this. A lot of companies use the perimeter security model. Think of it as a castle with very thick walls and only one single point of entry and exit that's heavily guarded. Everything outside of this castle is dangerous, of course. Everything inside is trusted. Issue being that anyone who makes it past that drawbridge is now considered trusted and has access to everything. We decided this isn't going to work for us. Instead, there was something else. 
And if you haven't heard of it, it's a framework that a lot of companies with our culture and scaling initiatives have started to adopt. And uh, it was originally founded by Google, and it's called Beyond Corp. So lots of research to, to read. I will not sit here and read it to you, but I will read you a snippet. Um, and I'll provide a reference at the end, but you can find all their documents on beyondcorp.com. They've written uh, articles for Usenix, uh, I think, five times now over the last six, seven years. But the main point, which I'll read out to you now, is why it differs from the, from the perimeter security model. Access depends solely on device and user credentials. Regardless of a user's network location, be it an enterprise location, a home network, a hotel or a coffee shop. All access to enterprise resources is fully authenticated, fully authorized, and fully encrypted based upon device state and user credentials in that point in time. Yeah, that's a lot of words. So, how though? You may be feeling that, like this poor Uber driver who's just completely lost and doesn't know what to do. Well, he's <laughs> gonna find his way through that ocean and he's gonna pick up his fare. And we're gonna, we're gonna find our way through this presentation. So remember, what I'm talking about is a framework. It's a framework that every organization is going to implement differently based on what they have available to them. Google built this giant map of lovely applications that they mostly built in-house. They have a lot of developer teams. And don't be surprised that this took six to seven years to get to the point that it did. This is not magic. Netflix also built uh, Lisa, which is location-independent security approach. And they use a different system. I will link Brian Zimmer's talk. He also, uh, he also gave a really good talk about the workflows they've done. And they actually still use VPNs. So it's, it's sort of opening you up to the idea that it, there is not just one way to do this framework. And of course, there's lots of third party um, companies that are willing to sell you a solution that can help you get to this kind of framework. Things like Duo Beyond or Cloudflare Access or ScaleFT with their access fa fabric. The list goes on. There's lots of them. You can Google them. I promise I'm not you know, pulling secrets from places. Um, so <coughs> we as Shopify will do it our way as well because of how we began in our infrastructure and how our tools work together. Now I want to preface by saying we're not all the way there and this is to get you into the idea of Beyond Corp and share my learnings as well as things that we're building and adopting for our future. So let's get into it. Now, lots of companies have one corporate building, many corporate buildings with this perimeter security model. It's very, very difficult to consider another solution when this works. Um, our structure is a little bit different. Like I said, people work in our offices, people work from home, people work from airports or cafes or who knows where. And the list does truly go on. We don't put a lot of trust in most of those networks, so it makes no sense to just trust one, like our corporate network. So what's left then? Well, like I said, device and the identity of your employee is what's left. And access should be handed based on the state in, point in, in that point in time of both the identity of the user and the, the device that you've provided to them. And so base trust for a user would be things like, are they actually <coughs> still an employee? Which department do they belong to? Do they have multi-factor authentication enabled? And then for their device, we want to know, are they in a known inventory? Like, let's say Jamf Pro. Do they have the latest OS? Are they encrypted? And the list goes on. Now for us, we, we checked off a big box as well that, that helped us out. So before I get into device and identity, I want to talk about the things that we excel at. And of course, that is having our resources all in the cloud. We were blessed enough to never have a company internet or VPNs. And fully cloud-based is a lot easier to implement a zero trust network security model. So no matter if you're fully on-prem, the migration to Beyond Corp will be easier <coughs> if you start taking a look at cloud now and figuring out ways to maybe migrate in that direction. Hey, if on-prem works and you know um, your perimeter works, I'm not the one to tell you to change it. 
Um, but for us, we have to consider simplicity and we have to consider building for the long term and not moving backwards by providing people to en enroll with a VPN or, or sign into everything in that sort of sense. It also helps that we're fully, our infrastructure is fully cloud-based. We use Google, Google Cloud Platform with Kubernetes for orchestration. So it makes our, our office networks equivalent to Starbucks, probably like 100 times faster, but still very similar. And we've already automated this whole process. We have, ser we have a services DB, we call it, where employees can easily deploy any internal application they build and have this specific automation run, run them through if they have logging, if they have um, bug snag, if they have various other security metrics, and even put them on a roster to compete with other teams. And it's really neat. Highly recommend that you, uh, you check out these two talks. I'll have them in my reference slide as well. Uh, John Pulsifer is our resident cube expert. He talks about our infrastructure in cloud. And John Arthorn is our resident everything expert, I guess. He's a production engineer. And he talks about this services database where you can easily deploy a secure app. So those are just two asides that I think are very, very important to remember. Now, services in the cloud, when talking about identity, can get tricky too. It's not very easy to constantly be deploying new third-party SaaS applications um, whenever anybody needs one or says, this is really neat, like, can I try it out for a little while? So how would we assign these applications to people? How would we maintain a user directory without having LDAP or Active Directory? Uh, how would we set group rules to make it more automated? Well, we decided that we would go with Okta. And so Okta is our authorization kind of hub. We use G Suite, our productivity line, to identify an, this specific employee. And Workday, our HR platform, to verify that employee. We have a lot of information pooled into, into Okta, like the, the fact that we can manage an employee life cycle fully. We, can sh we automatically get uh, job title changes, which we use for grouping, so specific assignments to specific applications go by uh, what team you work on, maybe even what office you work on, what you work in. We have automated account shutdowns so that we know as soon as an, an employee is no longer with us, they are no longer trusted and therefore access is re revoked automatically. And of course, the greatest thing about being on cloud is how many awesome, cool, wow, um, beta features that I get to experiment with. Uh, things like Okta's device trust and security be behavior analysis and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's really an exciting place to be uh, if you can be there. And alongside that, in this identity kind of world that I'm talking about, we have to remember that openness to our data and the way we provide access does not mean that we lack auditing. We aggregate more and more data from all of these sources. These are just examples from Okta. And eventually, in this beautiful world in my head, we will be able to give feedback to employees in a way that makes sense to them. So the vision is, bad things happen, let's say that red dot, there's a sign-in from a weird location, I have to notify a user some way. So by pushing the envelope, I'm thinking, we use a communication tool every single day that everyone is obsessed with, Slack. Why can't I build a bot in Slack to notify users of suspicious activity and tell them what to do? or remediation. Exam another example would be, let's say they're working on a, on a repo in GitHub. They usually just work on one project. Suddenly, over the course of a day, they pull down 50 other projects. And we need to be able to do something about that. We need to be able to shut down access until we can confirm it truly was them. And I think that by, by sort of building a tool like this, it will really make users aware of their identity and hopefully fight more to protect it. So now let's switch it up a little bit. We're going to talk about devices, like these random ones. I just thought the image was high quality. I don't know what they are, but whatever. Uh, devices are the second part of, of the framework. Of course, you begin with a device inventory. We use Jamf Pro for our, our inventory. It manages the life cycle of devices, goes through um, the user records and, and assigns them. And um, we have to get a little bit creative because we don't have Active Directory. But right now, we do DEP with pre-staging. And I'm fighting for fully DEP by end of year. Here's hoping. Um, but we are evaluating a lot of new tools that will help us connect that 
bridge the gap between the employee and the device and have like true trust, 100% trust. So instead of telling you my beautiful plans uh, that don't exist yet, I'm going to tell you what we did build. Um, we first started out with tiers. So what I'm talking about here is device tiers that I guess create a sliding scale of trust. So think of it as conditional access, right? Um, for example, I would have somebody who wanted to access their pay stub in Workday. I would say that maybe they just need to be part of tier one, which is having two-factor enabled. But if I have somebody that wants to log in to our infrastructure or to AWS, I would say maybe just a, min a minimum of tier two, which could be has two-factor, has the latest OS, the device is in, in the inventory, and it's encrypted. So those are just examples of things like that. And so we had to write these. And my god, are they boring. Like, who would ever sit here and do each one of these and check on their computer if they, could, if they had it enabled, and if not, enable it, all that stuff. We had to start somewhere, right? And I wrote these, and I'm bored. OK. So I had a uh, brilliant idea, because I'm brilliant. I'm just kidding. I'm not that egotistical. But I had a really good idea. I wanted to make that more interactive. I wanted to make people transparently see what's going on with their device without clicking through a million options in their laptop to see if it's encrypted or not, so on and so forth. So I decided to use our hack days for this. Hack days, if you've never heard of it, it's two days every quarter for us. And it's two days where you can experiment with projects that don't have to do anything with what you're usually working on. And you can rally a team for these projects from any, anywhere within the company. So my thought was, we already have Friendly Ghost. Gives me transparency, gives the users transparency into their device. Why couldn't I use Jamf as well to make people more conscious about their device and identity in regards to security? Well, the answer is I could. And so that's what we did. And what we decided to start working on for Hack Days is Friendly Ghost 2.0. Here we implemented our tiers for the devices that, that the user had available. Same kind of process, the API calls with Jamf using um, the RubyJSS gem. RubyJSS? JSS. I forgot to write it down, so now I'm the worst. Um, and so I wish I could promise you that we're going to open source this like tomorrow or it's out now, but uh, we're still working on it and there's lots to do. Um, but if you are interested in a project like this, I highly recommend that you check out uh, Netflix Stethoscope. We decided to go uh, with our own because we already had a structure that was built and we're a very Ruby heavy environment. Anyways. Back to Friendly Ghost. First stage that I had to do was map out everything that has to do with the milestones. I did sort of three different things. I used Jamf extension attributes, smart groups, and then I also had to use manual questions for things that I couldn't really derive from Jamf. As you can see here, it just has a workflow. It tells you what, what may happen, and the red button will tell you the remediation action that needs to happen. Now, what it looks like for after two days of work, is pr I'm pretty impressed with it. Two days of hard coding to get, to get to this point. We have a tier. It tells you it's in progress because there is a questionnaire missing. Do you have a strong login password? So this is a really good education point for users as well to understand what a strong login password means. Once they complete it, they get a checkbox, and they move on to the next tier. For things like has latest OS, you can see there's a warning, but no information. That's something, obviously, we're still working on. And we will implement little info boxes on, on how to remediate there. But we're off to a really good start. And, uh, and it's, we have lots to do on it. And because we still had time at, in, during those two days, I guess, I don't know how, we built an admin side to Friendly Ghost as well. This just lets us scale really quickly. We can modify tiers very quickly and add things if we need to. And so future features, well, I'm going to showcase them because maybe one day we will be open source and then you'll all get this. But uh, travel map, we want to be able to implement a travel map where you could click a country and we could give you uh, security practices to be mindful of when you travel. Of course, automation, my biggest one. 
I want people to not go into their own menus and click around to, to get things to be, uh, to be you know, on the latest tier or whatnot. I want to be able to deploy everything in self-service, have a button that runs them through it, or have, a, have that same bot in Slack notify them that their encryption is not, is not, um, is not found. And those are extremely important because if you make it easier for the user, it's going to get done. And if you notify them in the right way with, with a tool that they use already, it's going to get done. Another thing I want is uh, team analytics. So uh, being able to, as a lead, maybe being able to see your team, see where they're at for, let's say, the encryption of devices or multi-factor on their accounts or being up to date. And creates a little bit of friendly competition, sort of like our services DB did with our uh, infrastructure. If we, you have a leaderboard, maybe you're more inclined to you know, be the best. And of course, this is the introduction to more gamification. So leaderboards, like I said, badges, points, XP bars, things that people that drive people to do it because they're having fun. And so this is the topic that's very dear to my heart and the really important step, in my opinion, to the overall path to Beyond Corp and reducing risk in your environment. And that is motivation and gamification. So this is not talking about me playing Monster Hunter and Destiny and getting the coolest loot and whatever for hours on end. This is about talking about the fun and engaging game design elements that really get you motivated to do something, but using them in a non-game context. So that's what, we, what, what I really want to talk about next. I was extremely inspired by Masha, who is the CPO of Elevate Security, a company in, in California. She believes that changing security behavior is your best defense. It reduces risk, obviously. And the way that we can create this change is with motivation and gamification. By hearing her talk, I was inspired to share the kinds of things that we're doing at Shopify in the past year, like Friendly Ghost, and some more things that I'll continue to share. But I want to recommend her talks to anyone because it really opens your mind up to a, diff, a, a way of human thinking rather than just building tech solutions without realizing, realizing why. So after she recommended to me a million good books, which I will recommend as well, they're all in my reference slides, I began to read this one. And so if you haven't heard of it, the power of habit is about something called the habit loop. We all have it and we all do it. And when you read this book, you will look at everyone else very differently. Um, you have three points here, cue, routine, and reward. And the sort of main point to take away from this is that habits run automatically, like you pulling out of your driveway in the morning and not realizing that you just committed that whole action. Um, it saves you brain space, and it's been proven that habits live in a different part of your brain. And another example is, let's say, Q would be you smell coffee. Routine would be you get yourself a cup of coffee and you drink it. The reward you would get is energy, right? And I'm sure we all do it. Um, but of course, there are negative habits as well. You can't just say they're all positive. Uh, this book sort of talks about modifying habits to, for, for the better. I highly recommend this book. So why should we care? Well, why do we care about this in security and IT? Well, I'm going to tell you why. We hired people at all of our companies to do fantastic jobs in what they were hired to do. <coughs> we hired designers to create amazing products. We hire accountants to do all the work and pay us every month. We did not hire them to be ex experts in security. That's our job. And why don't people do it? Why don't people care, even if we try? Well, think about it this way. I, let's say, like to exercise. And I'm hanging out with my friends and telling them how great it is. And they don't care. They don't have the same motivation. They're excited to go home and eat, eat the leftover pizza in the fridge. There's no way that I can imply or make so many changes to the, the way that they think just because I believe it. And so for your, for your end users, it could be a multitude of different reasons why they won't do something. I have some examples. It could be, simply, that they're extremely busy and they don't have time. And 
the IT perhaps created a queue like a software update or you know asking them to encrypt at the wrong time. It may not mean anything else. It's just easily forgotten. It could be that there's a, there's a culture, a subculture in your company where they feel punished for clicking a link or not updating and therefore it makes it even worse and it impacts people negatively. It could be that there's mandates or training, training courses that they have to do and they get penalized if they don't do them. And these are the kinds of things that we really have to think about before implementing anything. If we can't get good habits to formulate naturally, uh, we persist this stuff. And I hate this. This drives me nuts. I saw it posted on Facebook and then I'm like, I'm going to make sure that gets into my slides. Um, negativity does not increase security. Um, people get very resentful and powerless. And the worst of all, they get quiet. And quiet is what's dangerous because, as you all know, the easiest way to get breached is still through us humans. So it makes me think about how can we empower people? How can we get them excited? And I had, I guess, a, a stupid little thing happen at the, at the border office. Um, I'm crossing the border and the guy's just like looking through my papers. What do you do? And I always, I always don't know what to say I do because people don't know what internal security is and whatnot. So I just say, I just do cybersecurity. And then he just got all, all excited and put everything down. He's like, you? You keep the hackers out? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I keep the hackers out. <laughs> Anyways, but I realized that like, this wasn't the only time that I, I felt that somebody else was excited about this whole like, you know, defend against the hackers kind of thing. And this hacker culture is extremely powerful. The way that I first started implementing it, which I cover here, is I started looking at our really crappy outdated security onboarding and I wanted to make it more interesting. I started with silly little things like photos and what to do in a crisis and like what kinds of data, data breaches there are or if your laptop is stolen, the kinds of cool tools that we can use to recover it. Worked pretty well, right? Um, people laughed. This is a GIF too, so it's even better because you just, while reading, you keep looking at it. Um, then I really talked about social engineering and I talked about phishing and, and what it means. And of course, then I created, I added in a clickbaity kind of video that everyone's going to click on, obviously. <laughs> and it worked really well. People were pumped about this and they watched it and ha learned something new that is possible. And I'm not going to spoil it for you because you're going to watch it later. Um, but this worked a lot better. It got people really into the idea that they have power and they can prevent bad things from happening. And then, of course, I wanted to gamify things even more. So I created a little uh, snippet of, uh, you know, how passwords don't have to suck. And we all know the XKCD comic, but I didn't put it up here because it's just too busy. But I created this little password and ran it through a, a system that tells you how long it would take to brute force with a home computer. And it got people excited because now they're building, they're, they're building passwords that they can remember and they're excited to see how many centuries it takes. And mine is pretty awesome. It's 10,000 centuries. So whatever. I'm cool. Um, and so this is what I mean by building motivation, right? We are very techn technological thinkers and we think about how to improve tools and so on and so forth, but we really have to not ignore this, this aspect of human behavior as well. Um, another example that I have is uh, the ever famous LinkedIn. Um, it's gone through many iterations and if you all remember, they're all sort of similar. But I have to say, when it told me I was one step away from being an all-star, if I just did this one thing, I would be an all-star and everything would be great, uh, I had to do it. So I think it was asking me to fill in like my summary there, which is like two sentences. And uh, then they gave me this really awesome icon and I just got so excited. And it's so small, but like my, my profile's done. I'm gonna get hired anywhere now. It's great. Um, and so these are the kinds of things we have to start considering. And these are the kinds of things that I'm considering for Friendly Ghost. So as you saw, it was just sort of lists with check marks and X's, but I want to make it more exciting. I want to give people badges for completing tiers. I want to give people, you know, cake for completing tiers. And this makes people really, really excited. And I have proof for that because we have an internal application called Unicorn where we praise people for doing a good job and we level up to different stage levels. And 
I guess another w example that I have uh, of gamification is uh, these lovely little trust coins that I brought with me and giving people this to feel like ambassadors of trust and that they are part of solving a much bigger problem. And in case you're wondering, I have these here because I want some good questions and you all, all who ask a question will get one of those. Um, and stickers, obviously. Um, so, as you can see, I started off with talking about sort of the wider framework and it is a huge puzzle and every company will deal with this huge puzzle in different ways. We are beginning to put it together and uh, we have a very large mission ahead of us, but I've explained why it's really important and why we can't really go backwards here and sort of some of the tools that we keep improving. But truly the core values of why we're doing everything is identity trust, device trust, and now because of me, <laughs> uh, awareness and education because of our open culture. Now to just think of a really great acronym like device identity assessing network architecture. <laughs> it's pretty good. Or uh, device integrity access network architecture. Or maybe even device identity authorization and authentication. I'm just joking. Maybe I have a bit of an ego. Uh, anyways, I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can chat me up on Slack. And here are my uh, lovely so, references. Question. Anyone? Oh, wait. oh one there. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Nice talks. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Hugo. I, can you talk a little bit about a spot where you thought you were going to get more uptake than you got, or where you got a moment of pushback that you weren't necessarily expecting? Yeah, so remember when I said um, a reason why people might not be doing things is because of a, po a poorly timed queue? Well, that was my first idea as like an IT kind of administrator to say like, oh, people just need like pop-ups and things, and like maybe that'll get them excited and, and they'll do it. but. It, you have no idea how somebody's going to react to those because they're in the middle of something or it gets thrown up while they're in a, in a presentation or, or whatnot. Um, that was something that really taught me that this is not the right way to go about it. Um, and to be honest with you, I think I'm still struggling to find the best solution for our environment, but I think the idea of Friendly Ghost and the idea of really gamifying uh, the reason you're doing it is going to help, but definitely there's things and what I learned was instead of deploying things right away, like get some data from the before and then get the data after to see if it, if it was even worth it. So I'm not throwing the coin at you, by the way, because you're going to get hit really hard. So just come get one after. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How have you found the gamification working with the, the higher ups, the people who traditionally are like, no, I want IT to do everything for me because I haven't got time to do anything. Do, do they respond to it, or do you have to use other methodology for the people who just don't, really just don't care? So I have an example for that. I had a meeting with my CEO, actually, to set up his device for traveling. And uh, I'm basically running him through the tiers because we didn't have Friendly Ghost yet. It was before that hack days. And he's looking at me going, can't we just automate these things? Like, why do I have to do this? And I'm like, yep, yep, Toby, don't worry, we're, we're on it. Um, so our higher ups are very much aligned with our trust team and the idea that like, uh, it should just be this easy and it should be putting trust in our employees rather than enforcing things. Uh, we have not enforced a lot at Shopify. Um, because, of, because of trying to maintain that culture and the culture of trusting people. So it works for us well because of the executive team being extremely open to that. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm lucky for that. <laughs> yeah, Rich. <laughs> oh, hello, yes. Join the queue. Um, Thank you. Um, the bit where you said getting users to value their identity yep. um, kind of strikes a chord because it's, it's one of the, the most cringeworthy parts of actually working within an IT department when someone drops a laptop back in the pile and says, some it's not working and there's my password on the post-it. Um, <laughs> it just it makes you die a little inside every time. Yep. Um, but it seems that in, in certainly in a lot of traditional 
sort of IT working environments, there doesn't, there isn't the tool set in place to uh, mitigate that. So the user expects you to proxy for them to experience their problem to fix it. How have you attacked that problem? Um, let me think here because I, I am not very familiar with how IT does things now. But for example, what do we have? Support-wise, they have to come up and see IT, uh, sit with IT to get their problem fixed. Um, for upgrades, they book on a schedule and uh, it becomes a process of, of trusting them with, with their identity. Um, we, we work in a very high-paced environment, but we, we take no nonsense to the kind of, I'm too busy, do it for me kind of thing. Um, but we do, uh, let me think. Yeah, I, we don't really do much of the, oh, like we need your password and, and this is an issue. Uh, we, if we do repairs, which we do in-house, it is very much, uh, if you don't have it backed up, just warning you, you could lose everything because we're not going to sign in and, and do any, any of that kind of stuff. The team is small. We have to find ways to make people more empower, empower themselves rather than t putting it on, on, a on a team specifically. Um, so that's sort of all, the only examples I can think of. If I think of any more, I'll, I'll let you know. Hi. Hi. I wanted to ask about uh, passwords versus using multi-factor authentication, how far that's gotten in your shop, if you're still using mostly passwords, or if you're using multi-factor, and how you were encouraging folks to use multi-factor if that was the case. Yeah. Uh, you uh, enforce it. It's great. You just turn it on and, and make people do it. Uh, in Octo, it's enforced. <laughs> And uh, so some of our offices, uh, we require YubiKey only, so they are YubiKey only. Um, how we enforce it, it's tough. I, be, I, Okta came after Google, for example, right? So, so Okta was deployed and we had it already enforced and it is part of onboarding. So when you onboard at Shopify, you, you have a laptop, it's DP, so it's sealed in a box and we run you through a quick little kind of onboarding thing. Uh, where we make sure you enroll and, and enable a two-factor on your G Suite as well as Okta. G Suite is still separate. Okay. So we also go through, because I have yelled many times, uh, not to use SMS, and people start to really understand how useful Google Prompt is and Okta Verify, where it's like, it's just one click of a button, like on your phone, you don't even have to type in a code, whatever, and that makes people excited. So you, if you give them an easier way and you explain to them, what they're protecting. I found that it, it worked a lot better for us, but to be honest with you, the bigger, bigger part of it was that we had it enforced and people were like, oh, I guess I have to do this, so I'm gonna do it. So, okay. but it is, we're still password, we still have passwords, but we have multi-factor on everything, so. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Robin here. Hey. Um, do you find that people understand why they need to be secure? Because, I mean, there are two takes on this. You can either go the, the mind hack way, which you're doing, that people are chasing badges, which is really cool, and it works. Or you can have people be educated enough that they understand why they should have uh, multi-factor authentication or why their computer should be, be encrypted. And, and yeah, do you, do you feel that people become educated? Or is that even something worth, ch worth chasing? Um, I definitely do. If people have an understanding, then they're going to do something more because our, like the examples of the onboarding document, the security crash course kind of thing that I wrote, uh, that was sort of what it was meant to do. It was meant to make you feel like you are making a, a, a cause and a change to not only the security of our company, but the security of your own personal information. Uh, that little video, the two minute video of getting hacked was like somebody hacking into um, a specific a cell phone account, right? And so the awareness of why you would do it is extremely critical. So our training onboarding kind of course thing is a mix of the why as well as the how because um, I've been I've been watching a lot of uh, TED talks now. You know the whole why people will buy the why people will not buy your product for the what and the how. So that that is sort of how we're we're gearing towards any product that we make or any uh, initiative that we take. So uh, yeah, definitely is something that makes a huge impact. Um, whether I can give you data for that, uh, check back in six months. <laughs> Thanks. It's literally a line of coins I have to hand out. <laughs> You're not gonna have enough coins. Yeah, right. <laughs> that was too easy. <laughs> uh, 
I don't work in security, but I'm interested in a lot of these tools. Um, as someone who does work in security, do you have any recommendations for how I should perhaps approach our security team about looking at these? Uh, watch my talk. Cool. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I, I, that's, it's it's tough, me. right? Because it, it is based on um, it's based on the way that your security team handles things, right? Mm. The big point is the perimeter security model is like what everyone, almost everyone's doing because they think that this is going to work long term where we have only one office, whatever. So I think the first thing you need to do is have exposure, give them exposure to the idea that there is something else. And then by doing that to see if, if it is possible or there's a reason for your organization to go in that direction, they'd be more mindful and open to, oh, by the way, this, this might actually help and there's tools cool. to, to do it. So that's sort of the approach I would, I would take. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. No worries. Oh, <laughs> ready? There we go. Oh. <laughs> Close. That wasn't me. I, that was a good throw on my time. Just saying. I'm not too big into sports, as you can see. Um, happy to hear that you approach IT situations from the human standpoint. It's ha nice to know that more and more people are doing this. Um, we also used to have this kind of culture in the uh, company that I used to work for, and we went through the education process and like how to do security and kind of gamified it in a way. But then it became easier for the users just to do the things and like move quickly, break stuff, and then just ask for forgiveness later. How do you deal with that? Yeah, we break a lot of shit at Shopify. So uh, let me think here. It is a learning experience. Uh, I became very humble watching our um, our infrastructure team and production team when there's a breach happen, it's like, it's clockwork and it's beautiful. Um, so I, I can't, what we seem to keep doing when, when people do move fast and break things is find a way to automate whatever is breaking because it tends to be human error. It tends to be uh, maybe even a deadline. And that's not really something that we should be wasting our time with anyways. Uh, so f things like, not encrypting your secrets uh, into your production environment when you're deploying into GitHub. Those are things that we were dealing with. So how do you sort of enforce it? Well, we have boot camps or we have, uh, we're working on a tool to automatically encrypt secrets and, and you know, that kind of stuff. So I hate to say it, but using technology to automate is, is the best way to alleviate that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. And another thing is, there's certain things that people will break so hard that it will affect your culture. And what I found is that unfortunately it has to happen. And people will learn by the fact that there will be a major breach or there will be something that really gets leaked and then they have to change the way that they think. So unfortunately for some of it, you just have to say, I'll do my best in automating this or, or finding the root cause. But sometimes you just gotta let people take the hit, so. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to add to that and say, well, if, if nobody breaks stuff, if stuff doesn't break, then we never learned how to fix it, right? Yeah. So. Cool. So any other questions? Oh, one more. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. No one needs a break. <laughs> you know, the reason they stretch it is because they don't want karaoke time. That's, yeah, all that's it probably is. it. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> uh, actually, if anyone does have a genuine question, mine was more of a story than anything else to support the sometimes things don't change until you break something. Yeah. So does anyone have a genuine question? Okay. So um, years ago, I worked at a uh, government agency that will remain unnamed. Um, and they had a mandate to encrypt all the laptops. Uh, and several senior folks decided that there should be a waiver process. Um, to get out of having to encrypt your laptop. And so it came to be one fine day, one of these uh, senior folks had their laptop stolen from the back of their car uh, with a laptop that was loaded with patient data, which for anyone who deals with PII, that, that is the gold of personal identifiable information is patient data. And uh, they were gonna land on this guy like a ton of bricks until he pulled out his waiver, which had been signed by his director. And he had followed all the proper procedures and so there wasn't a single thing they could do to the person. Oh my God. The next day, there was a new procedure in place <laughs> saying that 
Now, there was still a waiver process, but now the waiver had to be signed by the overall director of the parent government agency, <laughs> which no one was ever going to get. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. in government, anything could be waivered and anything in security can be waivered. But yeah, after that, they were, they were just like, the only way that system was going to change was for an incident like that. Yeah. And then it happened. Flip and, and then learn. it changed. Yeah.